right, Lindsay, I'll let you turn off the music for us. Thank you. Welcome, everyone. We're so glad to have you with us. And while we can't be together in person, we are so glad to welcome you to the 2020 AVE Math Institute in the comfort of your own homes. So we are excited about today. We have uh, been planning this for a long time and are so glad to see so many people are able to join us for a day of math, teaching and learning. So a couple of things. Um, I'm Patsy Egan. I direct Atlas housed at um, Hamlin University, and I'm joined by an amazing team of people who have made today come to be. So first of of all, Marisa Giesler is in charge of our tech for this session. If you are having any audio issues or other technical difficulties, please chat directly to her. A couple things if you're not terribly familiar with Zoom, there's a gallery view or a speaker view. You'll find that in the upper right hand corner of your screen that you can mess with and see what your preference is. At the bottom of the screen, you'll need to hover a little bit with your mouse to reveal a few more controls. We ask that you do keep uh, yourself muted and your video off during most of the day. We'll let you know and it's okay to turn those on. And there's um, also a participants um, button that you can hit and that allows you to raise your hand and such and give the, um, the speaker a thumbs up, for example. The chat box is also located there. You can use that to chat with the whole group or to someone specific uh, like Marisa if you're having any audio or visual issues. Also the controls for closed captioning and uh, those reactions are down there as well. Just a reminder as well that most of today's event will be uh, recorded and posted publicly with, the, uh, with one exception that we'll let you know about. All right, so welcome. We are so glad to be here in this space and have some time uh, for math today. So we hope you're able to put aside everything else that you have going on for at least most of the day and spend some time thinking about teaching and learning math. So I am actually going to introduce a couple of people who've been pivotal in making today happen. First of all, Gail Rutan, and Gail will come on to say hello. Uh, Gail is our events manager. Hello, everyone. And Marisa. She's not in the Hi. middle of helping someone. There she is. <laughs> Hi, everyone. Welcome. So we are Team Atlas, um, and we have kind of behind the scenes uh, the people who are making today happen. And I want to be sure you all know about Lindsay Pust. Lindsay is our numeracy coordinator who will tell us more about who's been involved in making today. Yes, thank you, everyone, for being here. I am so excited. Um, and. Yeah, we have a really fun day planned, really meaningful fun day planned. So um, for those of you who don't know, I used to be Cermak, now I'm Poost, I got married. We'll keep going, but just wanted to say that. I'm pretty excited about it. Um, we also have our A team. And so you can see their names on the screen. We have, um, if, and if they can just turn, if you can just turn your camera on and just wave. So if you're like, who are these people? You can look at your gallery view, but Andy Alby, Amber Gallagher. Good morning, everybody. Katie, um, Cheeky, and Chris Kloss, um, Marcy, Megan, Rebecca, Terry, Tom, Patsy, and Astrid, all of us um, have been working hard on this event, and we are so excited you are here. Um, a few professional development opportunities we want to make sure you are aware of. Um, if MCTM, the Minnesota Council for Teachers of Mathematics Conference, um, if that conference that happens every spring is happening next spring, we then will have scholarships available for people to attend. So stay tuned with the state of the world. We will see. Um, these are the dates that they have slotted for uh, this event should it happen. Um, so stay tuned uh, to the, the newsletter because uh, we will be communicating that way around that opportunity. Um, and then also I'm going to actually um, turn this over to Rebecca Strom and, and Amber uh, to talk about the Adult Numeracy Network. Um, Rebecca is the state region, the state representative, and Amber is the, the regional representative for a &M. Thanks, Lindsay. Um, we are so excited to be able to share information about the Adult Numeracy Network with all of you. You may have seen us at um, different conferences with our flyers and our information. So ANN is a national organization dedicated to teaching numeracy and math to adults. Um, it's really cool that we have an organization specifically targeted towards our students and their needs. Um, as your regional rep, I help connect you to lots of things, including um, sharing challenges and joys and resources and insights and helping you think about ways to collaborate and ways to have leadership. Uh, Rebecca is going to share with you one really cool opportunity that comes with ANN. 
So I just uh, dropped a couple links in the chat box. One is the website for Adult Numeracy Network and one is uh, just a flyer so you can kind of see some of the information. Um, one of the things that we try to do is uh, as educators to keep learning and growing and so we offer opportunities for practitioner research. So often the research that's in education is K-12 based and so if it's something you're interested in finding out more about, if there's something you're interested in learning more about or trying out research, let us know. Um, we can hook you up some, with some resources and some support. There's even a stipend for uh, having practitioner research, completing a project and things like that. So um, yeah, keep us posted, but look at the ANN website has several examples of practitioner research. Um, as a member, you can see all of the examples. As a non-member, you can peek through some and see what's out there. Thank you so much. Um, I also want to uh, mention this resource. This is a K-12 resource, but um, uh, they have free PD every Tuesday from 8 to 9 p.m. And so um, Googling Global Math Department presentations, that is also um, something to check out and see if the topics are relevant for our work as well. Um, and then Twitter and Facebook, social media, there are math communities on uh, Twitter and um, a huge math community on Twitter and also um, uh, a math community on Facebook. And so the MTBOS hashtag, see, I'm, I need to get better at Twitter. I say this every year. Every year, this is my New Year's resolution. Um, but we have some amazing uh, experts on this call that if you ever want to get involved with Twitter, um, Abby Rosa, um, Tom Kroger, Amber, ask them and they will help you for sure. Um, there are amazing resources that are shared, lesson plans, ideas, conversations. Um, to take advantage of that. And I'll turn this over to Patsy. Yeah, I'm actually Astrid, do you want to say a few words about what's coming up this fall? Absolutely. Good morning, everyone. This is Astrid Leiden from the Department of Ed. I am wanting to share with you just a couple of other big statewide events that we have going on this fall and winter. I want to make sure you mark your calendars. Uh, the next big event is our statewide fall teaching and learning at a distance conference. Since we are not able to gather in person for regionals this fall, we've decided to come together as a state to discuss and share best practices for teaching and learning in distance and hybrid environments. This event will be the afternoon of November 5th and all day November 6th. We have over 20 concurrent sessions planned. There'll be an opportunity for networking around uh, specific roles and content areas and affinity groups. So we're really excited about this and hope that you'll join us. Registration will be opening up in just a couple of weeks. And then on the next slide, um, more opportunities for learning. At the end of October, our first CCRS webinar of the season. And then several different events. Our support staff conference will be happening November 12th and 13th. Uh, Thursday will be a day of test administration training and Friday will be concurrent sessions. December 4th, the volunteer management conference. Programs are finding some really innovative and unique ways to use volunteers to support their learners with distance education. So hope you can join us for that. And then finally, looking ahead to January, January 27th, 28th, the Language and Literacy Institute. And all of these events will be held virtually. So you can check the Atlas events calendar for more information and registration as it becomes available. Turn it back over to Lindsay to introduce our presenters. Thank you. So um, like I said, we are so excited about today. Um, we have Joey Lehrman here. He is, you're gonna, we're gonna hear from him first um, for the keynote, and then we will get to uh, hear from him again after lunch. Um, we have Megan Himes, and we have Amber Deliger and Cynthia, I don't know how to say your name, I'm so sorry, I should have asked, Secord. Um, and, but they are Cindy. Um, so they are gonna be presenting um, different sessions today that you'll be able to choose from. And then we have our wonderful A-team facilitators as well. So thank you everyone um, for all the work that you've put into making this possible. And we just also wanna call attention um, to the notice that, um, that we all received through registration and the flyer and 
and whatnot, the communication that Gail and Marisa have had with us to just note the expectations for participation. Um, it's at the end of today's flyer, just to ensure a positive experience for everyone. So uh, the flyer, we would, we would like you to have the flyer open. We're gonna be, um, or at least readily available. We're gonna be using that today um, a lot. And there are some, some notes at the very bottom if you wanna take a look. Um, some objectives for our time together. This is what we want to, um, we hope that you walk away with, um, to be able to articulate the power and versatility of online learning for both teaching and learning. Um, identify several practices for effective online math instruction. And to share with a colleague, be able to just share a few things um, and a few ways to build independent mathematicians in an online learning environment, um, empowering our learners to be able to do this themselves. So first we're going to hear um, from Joey. We have the keynote and then we will take a short break. Um, then we will have some unconference learning sessions uh, that you saw in the flyer um, that you will get to choose a session that piques your interest that you want to you want, these are going to be discussions. Um, so coming to discuss some, some relevant issues that we're facing right now. Um, there'll be a couple concurrent sessions then after another break to choose from. Um, and then after lunch, we will come together for the flipped classroom session. It's kind of like part two of the keynote this morning. So if you're able to stay the whole day, um, we highly encourage you to do that because it's kind of like sandwiched part one, part two. Um, and then we'll wrap up and, and be done by two o'clock. Just a quick heads up, we, we don't want this to be you. Unless, unless you want this to be you, it's fine, no judgment. Um, but there will be times throughout the day when we will ask you to turn your camera on um, and or unmute yourself to share. So just to be prepared for that, that that will be um, asked. Right. Thank you, Lindsay. <laughs> Hopefully everyone has a comb nearby for that purpose. <laughs> so thanks for that. So uh, something to know is that flyer that Mar uh, that Gail and Marisa have shared already in the chat this morning and that you received by email is a little bit magic. Um, and the reason is today you'll use it to get to all your sessions because it's like your guidebook. It will get you to the right um, meeting. And then later, that very same link will be where recordings are posted. Okay, so uh, we're not recording the unconference sessions, but everything else is being recorded and then you'll be able to access those later or if you miss something you want to go back, you, uh, those will be readily available in the same flyer. Also, triple the magic, the evaluation is also linked in the flyer and that evaluation is what you will fill out in order to get your CEUs. So it's been uh, chatted out a couple of times, you have it handy, Hang on to it. That's a link you're going to need for all sorts of reasons. Uh, Lindsay, we're ready for you to introduce Joey and to get our day started. Go ahead. Awesome. Okay. Well, um, I'll say a few words um, here. Oh, I should do that. Okay. Uh, about Joey, um, there are so many things. I am not listing everything that, that um, he has been involved in, but a few things. Um, he, if you don't know him, he is an experienced educator, speaker, and writer. Um, and focuses on how to use technology to create more accessible, relevant, and effective educational opportunities for adult learners. Um, in his primary role in the adult education program at Delgado Community College in New Orleans, Joey launched the first fully online adult education program in the state. Since 2014, the eLearn program has welcomed over 5,000 new distance learning students. Um, in 2019, he won a state Innovation of the Year Award at COABE for eLearn. Um, he also um, joined in 2019 the SkillRise Project, an initiative from the International Society for Technology and Education. The project provides free resources to help adult learning organizations explore how to use ed tech to advance lifelong learning. He was also selected as one of six national trainers to lead the outreach for Google's new applied digital skills curriculum. He's a level one and level two girls, Google, Google, Google certified educator. Um, and he has 12 years of classroom experience, including 10 years in adult ed. Um, and then lastly, in 2020, he was nominated to join the advisory committee for the outreach and technical assistance network. Uh, helping to shape vision and strategy for the organization that supports adult educators with distance and blended learning initiatives. I said all of that 
basically to say he is highly qualified to, to, to enlighten us and just help us along this new journey that we are on of online learning with adults learners. So Joey, um, feel free to take the screen. Thank you so much, Lindsay, and good morning, everyone. Welcome to the Math Institute 2020. I'm gonna have lots of thank yous to share throughout the keynote today, um, but a big thank you to Atlas and to the A-Team for welcoming me to today's conversation. Um, as Lindsay mentioned, I am the Program Effectiveness Coordinator with Adult Education at Delgado Community College. I'm also a project manager with the ISTE Skill Rise Initiative. I think my favorite element of the biography that was not shared though is that I was born and raised in Minnesota. I went to Armstrong High School and I spent the first 18 years of my life in Minnesota. So it's uh, truly a privilege and a treat to be able to join and connect with other Minnesota adult educators. Um, so with that, uh, I think we've done enough about my background. Uh, what I mostly wanna emphasize here is that my entire career has been in adult education and I've always played a focus on technology integration and distance and blended learning. Um, so with that, I wanna kick it off with the digital literacy tip. Um, this is how I start all of my presentations in the spirit of helping all of us continue to build new skills. So I wanna share a few of my favorite keyboard shortcuts. For those of you that might not be familiar, a keyboard shortcut is a way to complete a task without using the mouse. So open a new tab or copy and paste. So on the next screen, I'm gonna list through a few of my favorites, but for those of you that don't use them often, Essentially, you'll want to hold a key and then add another. So if you're on a Windows device, it'll start with control. If you're on an Apple device, it'll start with command and then you hold that and add another key to that. So to highlight a few of my three favorites, I think uh, control K is my number one most used. Um, that's for adding a link. So to kind of give you a quick visual of what that looks like, you just highlight text, hit control K, and then you can paste in that link. What's kind of nice about this shortcut is that it's true across a lot of applications. So you can use Control K in Gmail, in Outlook, in, in Google Docs, in Microsoft Word. So it's kind of uh, one of the few global keyboard shortcuts, kind of like Control C and Control V. Um, highlighting two of my other favorites, I think Control F is an essential 21st century skill because we're regularly doing research on the internet and it's a time saver to be able to find specific terms on a page. So control F is one of the first keyboard shortcuts that I'll share with my students when I'm teaching. Um, and then the third one, also a great one for adult learners would be control Z. That will undo something that you've done recently on a computer. Um, I think that one's great because adult learners approach technology often with anxiety. They kind of think, hey, I'm not that good with technology and I'm nervous that I'm gonna break the computer. Um, but Control Z is a great tool to share with them to say, hey, look, you can try new things, you can click on everything, you can explore, there's always a way to fix it, there's always a way to undo it. So as we get started with today's presentation, I'll be curious to hear, maybe post into the chat, what's your favorite keyboard shortcut? Which are the ones that you most commonly use? So I'm going to kind of move on to the slides, but you can keep that question in mind and maybe jump in. What is your most favorite keyboard shortcut? So I see people jumping in. Um, command shift four. Ooh, is that a is that a screenshot? I think command shift four might be a screenshot. Control N, Control Z, snip. Yep. So yeah, a screen uh, a keyboard shortcut to be able to take a screenshot. It's fantastic because of how often we're trying to show students things on screen. So quick ways to do that. And I see the chat alive now with people's favorite keyboard shortcuts. So thank you for jumping in. Um, and a few others on here, like if you're in Google Docs often, you can quickly add a comment and so forth. So check out some keyboard shortcuts as a way to kind of boost your productivity. Okay, so on our agenda for today, I wanna to kick it off by just talking about what's on everyone's mind. From there, we'll talk about some of the challenges that we commonly see in adult education and how some of the frequently proposed solutions are not effective for, for addressing those challenges. And then from there, we will share some practical tips and strategies for what we can do now to evolve our instructional model to better support independent math learners. Um, as Lindsay mentioned before, this is kind of a two-part presentation. So if anything captures your interest in this morning's conversation, I encourage you to, go, to come back this afternoon to be part of that flipped session workshop, which is going to be very interactive and collaborative, and we hope to see you this afternoon as well. Um, okay, so with that said, um, let me kick it off. So um, 
the global health pandemic has created quite the challenge and we've all been forced into this rapid response to distance learning but as a silver lining 97 percent of adult ed programs have been able to move some or all programming online so we're going to look at a series of issues that we're all experiencing today but i'm also going to sprinkle in a few positive moments like this to realize that hey we are trying to figure this out and we're surrounding our colleagues and our students with creativity and responding with unique opportunities to really connect with staff and students. So COVID is very much on everyone's mind. And we know that because it's ever present and because we're all working remotely and because it's created some unique challenges with our adult learners. So that's what we're gonna look at next. So this is where I want people to chime in on chat. Um, can we think of a job in 2020 that does not require digital skills? So I'll give everyone a few seconds to sit with that and kind of brainstorm. Um, can we think of a job that we can get or our adult students can get that essentially would not require any digital skills? Do I see looping, restaurant cook, custodial work? And feel free, um, if you see something on there, feel free to push back if you disagree. Um, I don't have all the answers here. This is an open brainstorm for the group. Um, so as we continue that brainstorm, I want to talk about how digital literacy is essential to the work we do as adult educators. And we can see that across the world nowadays. So whether it's navigating 21st century systems like being able to do online banking or pay utility bills um, or finding and applying for, job, for jobs or developing a resume or even accessing job listings, um, being a partner in kids K-12 education for those of you that have kids now, um, how many of their schools require that you interact in some way with a learning management system or a digital, communi digital communication system? Um, or how about all, all the free resources that exist online, being able to build a budget or use Craigslist or Facebook Marketplace to find free or low cost resources? Um, continuing on, uh, just using technology to be an independent learner and a continuous learner, and that's where we kind of land that digital literacy is an essential skill for math literacy. It's an essential skill for being a member of 21st century systems. Continuing to look at a bit of data to kind of inform the challenge that we all see, there are 37 million adults that have not completed a high school credential. Of those 37 million that need a high school credential or are looking to build English language skills, any guesses about how, what percentage of those adults that are enrolled with a literacy provider today? So there's 37 million adults in need of basic skills. What percentage of them are enrolled with an ABE provider or a library or a literacy provider? And I see our first guess is spot on. So typically only about 10% of adults with a high school diploma or English language skills are enrolled with a literacy provider. So even across all the great work that we are doing and our community of adult educators are doing, we're still missing 90% of those students in need. Um, we also know that a third of working adults have limited or no digital skills and tying that back to the digital literacy, we know it's an essential part of who we are as a society and what we need to be doing as adult educators. Um, one in six Americans between age six, 16 and 65 have low literacy skills, but 95% of them carry mobile devices. So we can see an opportunity right there to better connect with the 90% of adults that are in need of our services, but that we're not able to reach. But with that said, digital literacy is a challenge for a variety of reasons. 32 million adults can't use computer. That becomes even more acute when we look at black and Latino workers. Um, a third of US workers have limited or no digital skills. Um, continuing on, many households don't have internet access and a lot of people aren't comfortable using technology to learn. I do wanna emphasize here that there are some issues that we as adult educators can't solve. We're not gonna be able to connect every adult with um, internet access, for example. But I do believe that community colleges and ADE providers can play a pivotal role in outreach. We can help connect our students with free and low cost resources so they are better able to connect with this global community of teachers and students. Um, specifically thinking about digital literacy, I wanna offer kind of a new lens for thinking about what digital literacy is. 
think we've historically defined digital literacy as can you use a computer? Can you send and receive email? Can you access a local library? But I think we need to broaden that lens based on the data we saw on that last slide. It's not just one strand, it's kind of a three-legged stool. So there's the broadband layer. Do you have consistent access to high-speed internet at home? Do you have the hardware? And that can mean more than a mobile device because we know it can be challenging to practice essays or do math on a mobile device. Um, so do you have a laptop, a desktop, and a tablet? And then finally, if you have access and if you have the hardware, do you have the digital literacy skills needed to use um, those resources to solve problems and communicate and so forth? So the Digital Us Coalition has kind of expanded that into a new definition that they are coining as digital resilience, which is having the awareness or skills or ability to be empowered users of technology to ask and answer interesting questions, to connect with free and low cost resources and so forth. So as you work with your colleagues and as you work with students, I encourage you to kind of broaden that definition. It's not about literacy anymore. It's having the ability to learn and relearn and continuously build new skills. Um, another common phrase I hear in adult education is I'm not just, I'm just not that good with technology. I will note that my source for this is anecdotal just based on conversations with educators around the country. But another silver lining is I find that's actually not true. I think if we look at just the response to COVID-19, we are surrounding our students and responding with creativity. We are building new digital skills. I've talked to some programs that are just using mail packets that they sent, paper packets that they send through the mail, and then they have text threads and phone calls and video chats based on content that's set out. So that's a very lo-fi way to engage with our students. So when we hear that we're not just, we're just not that good with technology, I, I kind of think it's not true. And I want us to look around and take notes of moments to be proud. This year has been an extraordinary challenge for all of us. So I think it's important to take moments like this and say, hey, we brought 97% of our programs online. Um, and as an extension of that, we're responding with creativity to find new and interesting ways to engage with our students. But with that said, we are still struggling. There's been an estimated 30 to 60% decrease in attendance um, from post-COVID. And we all remember that's, that's true on campus as well. Our students are extraordinarily busy. There is unique demands, um, work commitments and family obligations and all sorts of things going on. So online, on campus, retention is a challenge with adult learners. Um, speaking just for kind of a localized view from where I work at Delgado Community College, um, typically about 30% of our students complete all intake requirements. So registration, testing, orientation, and are able to start their first class. Since COVID has set in, that's down to 5%. Similarly, typically about half of our students complete more than 80% of their classes. In the post-COVID world, that is 25%. So we know that COVID has amplified many of the challenges that we've commonly experienced in adult education. So to kind of summarize some of the ideas we looked at on the last few slides, we know that digital resilience is necessary and it should be core to the work we do as adult educators. We support literacy, we support numeracy, but we also need to start having focused conversations about digital re resiliency as the core of what we do as adult educators. Um, we also know that the future of learning on campus is uncertain, plus um, adults are busy. So like the time we spend with students is precious because it is so rare and scarce and often inconsistent. So we need to make sure we're using that time strategically. Um, additionally, even with those students that we do serve, we know we're still missing out on 90% of the population that's in need of literacy programming. Um, we also know that all of our classrooms are fixed with, fixed, filled with mixed levels. Um, and so how can we as adult educators connect with the varying needs that fill all of our classrooms? Um, and lastly, um, I think the phrase I hear most often is, hey, what are the steps to solve this problem? Um, and so we need to help combat the mentality that learning happens to students and really give our students control and agency to become independent math learners. So the variety of challenges that we're all experiencing in adult education are real. So I wanna spend a few minutes talking about what some common solutions are that have been proposed to address those issues 
and how, in my opinion, they're not sufficient for really realizing the future that we need with our adult learners. So the challenge, how do we increase engagement, retention, and outcomes with our students? What, in my experience, lectures typically do not work. As an extension of that, there's been some compelling research that explored three instructional models. The first was a traditional lecture, one teacher to 30 students. They all moved forward at the same pace. The second was mastery learning with one teacher and 30 students, but students had to demonstrate proficiency before progressing. And the last would be individual tutoring, where students had to demonstrate mastery before moving on and they were paired with an individual tutor. So this slide kind of shows the results. This is called a slow reveal graph. So if we had to kind of make some guesses, which outcomes do we think were the strongest? Was it lecture-based? Was it mastery-based? Or was it mastery-based where they also had an individual tutor? And I think it can probably be pretty obvious that when we pair students with a tutor, that's going to be the most transformative because we're building meaningful relationships with those students and we can identify their unique needs and help support differentiated learning. But what I find interesting about this is that the traditional lecture model was shown to be the least effective. So even transitioning to a model where students have to master content before they can move forward proved to be transformative as it led to a full standard deviation better in student learning outcomes. I'd also like to draw your attention to the fact that this research was done in 1984. So we've known for several decades now that lecturing is one of the most ineffective ways to engage our students and support positive learning outcomes. So wait, can I interrupt for one second? Um, what, is yeah. mastery, what does mastery-based mean? Yeah, great, good question. So mastery-based means a student has to demonstrate proficiency on a standard before they're allowed to progress. It's a very subtle distinction from completion based. So if we think about in a high school setting, students can kind of complete assignments and get credit to get a grade without demonstrating proficiency. And so as an example of that, how many high school graduates in America are not math literate? So it's possible to complete work without actually mastering it. And I see Amber in the chat kind of standards based grading or competency based grading or mastery-based grading. And so the idea is that it's not about completing activities, but showing authentic mastery of those standards before you progress. Um, continuing and thinking about the lecture challenge, I know this slide probably resonates with all of us as adult educators, and we've talked about it already, is that essentially um, lectures don't meet the unique needs of every adult in our classroom. Regardless of how good or bad TABE is or CASAS, the reality is our students are busy, and so they usually come to campus or come online when they can. So as a result, every adult ed classroom is always gonna be filled with mis mixed level learners. And so if we are in the front of the room as the stage on the stage and we're lecturing, it's gonna be challenging to meet the unique needs of all of our students. So to kind of summarize, quick brainstorming question, what are some of the things you wanna do with students but never have time? And I'll give you a few seconds to think about that. So we're regularly pressed for time. There's so much content to cover. If you had all the time in the world, how would you spend it? What are the things that you want to do to better engage your students? Let's see, use more manipulatives, make an IEP, provide individual help, project-based learning, um, problem solving skills. So asking deep engaging questions. There's some extraordinarily fun math questions that you can work on for weeks, but we're so pressed for time that we, we don't give ourselves the space to be really engaged with those deeper problems. If I were to answer this question, I would exclusively talk about the growth mindset. I would want to read about the growth mindset with my students and place it central to every conversation we have. So if we kind of summarize the last few slides, we know that lecturing doesn't work doesn't meet the unique needs of our students. We also know that students don't want us to lecture. And lastly, we don't want to lecture. So if we kind of bring that together, students don't want us to lecture, teachers don't want to lecture, and ultimately we know that lectures are ineffective. 
So the commonly proposed solution to that is automating math instruction. And so we can see an example here that we're celebrating the opportunity for immediate feedback um, or continuing on that you can get practice as many questions as you want and get that automated feedback. But what I wanna challenge in this model is that automatic feedback diminishes student thinking. There are so many interesting ways to have productive conversations, even when students get questions wrong. So the push towards computerized programs that differentiate content is something that I think doesn't actually address our goals here. It doesn't nurture independent math learners that can use technology and use their peers to drive their own learning forward. So automatic, quick feedback is not the solution as I see it. So let's start to explore how we can evolve that instructional model and, as Rebecca notes, provide more time in the productive struggle that leads to lasting learning outcomes. So thinking about technology and math, there are so many interesting wrong answers that we can look at. There are different themes that we can look at in a student video. So for example, what's the most common wrong answer to this problem? And then ask students, why do we think this is the most common wrong answer? Or if we see a student has approached a problem with a clever way of solving it, let's share that and kind of add our own teacher narrative on top of it so we're amplifying creative solutions to different problems. So kind of in summation, there are lots of interesting ways to be right and wrong in a math class, and that's where the productive struggle happens, and that's where we can engage our students in meaningful online and on-campus learning. So instead of using computers to give immediate feedback, let's use computers and technology to facilitate that kind of interesting and engaging conversation. And that is already happening. So I'm gonna talk a bit about our eLearn model in Louisiana throughout today. And we use it to connect learners across space and time. So jumping online with a live video chat, not to lecture, but to engage them in productive conversations. Luckily, the internet is filled with great resources that make this happen. So what I'd like to propose today is that synchronous time, whether that's on campus or online, is used for not explanations because those explanations exist elsewhere. And by explanations, I mean the lecture. So if we kind of think about it, the internet is filled with great lectures. It's filled with great explanations. So as an example, What's the last video you watched on YouTube to learn something new? And I'd like to hear from everyone here. Pop into the chat, take a second to think about it. This could be anything, something at work, something with your kids, something just to fix something around your house or exploring with your family. What's the last video you watched on YouTube to learn something new? So I see people are learning how to play instruments, how to fix their dryer, how to fix a sewing machine, how to fix a clutch, how to prune grapevines. So if you Focus your attention on the chat right now. There's an extraordinary response happening right now of people that use YouTube to watch those lectures. And so one theme I wanna kinda of emphasize today is that lectures and explanations aren't inherently bad, but educators that came before us used it because they didn't have this transformative technology. So we had to spend time in class providing those explanations because they couldn't access them elsewhere. So to return to that last slide, instead of using synchronous time on explanations, move those lectures to any time else. Students can watch YouTube videos on their phone, they can be engaging with content before and after class, and that frees us up to do all of the things that we want to do but never have time. And that's where meaningful online learning happens. That's where relationships get developed, and that's where we truly engage our students in lifelong learning. And like I said, the internet is filled with engaging content. So as a, a minor extension to that idea, um, I could lecture, but I'm pretty convinced that any topic I would lecture on, there's probably a better explanation online already, like a beautifully made video that's well edited and is really engaging. So not only shouldn't I lecture, but there are people that probably do it better and it can be accessed anytime, anywhere. Similarly, there's so much content online and all of it is for free. So to tie this back, or a lot of it is for free. 
So to tie this back to that original theme, um, if we can truly engage ourselves in tech or our students in technology rich environments, we can empower them to access this content anytime, anywhere. And speaking to a room, a quote, room full of math teachers, um, this content brings math to life. So thinking about re graphical relationships and plotting points on a coordinate plane, which will be the focus of our lesson this afternoon, technology can bring that to life. As a quick conclusion to kind of this idea, when we started to scale our distance learning model in Louisiana, it was in 2017, we added about five partners per year. Um, I want to talk about the division of labor. So we're the lead agency at Delgado. We write all of the curriculum and teach all of the online classes. We maintain the data and IT systems and then provide technical support. As a local provider, their staff will intake their students, orient them, provide coaching, and do pre and post testing. So even though our teachers are teaching these classes, the local providers get to claim credit in state reporting. The benefit of this model is that 80% of adult ed staff around the country are part-time. So if our staff are part-time, do they have the ability to write curriculum, learn how to teach online, and support their students, the most important part. So I wanted to emphasize this division of labor because I think there's a unique possibility right now for local providers to build a consortium. So providers in Minnesota, for example, to share curriculum with each other. Because once we have high quality curriculum written, that frees our teachers up to spend time building meaningful relationships with students. So at Delgado, we have one class that 10 or 20 different teachers might be teaching at the same time, and none of them wrote it. So instead of spending their time on curriculum development and revision, they're figuring out how to support the unique needs of each of their students. So to bring that together, my thesis here is that we should be using technology first and foremost to build relationships, to surround our students with high quality resources, and to empower our students as self-driven, quote unquote, math learners. So what can this look like? Where do we start? How can we maybe set some small goals and then grow our model from there? So if you're looking for maybe the simplest place to start, just consider using text messaging. Most of our students have mobile devices. They check their text messages frequently. So before you're gonna meet for class, maybe 24 hours or 48 hours before time, just send them a YouTube video to watch. You know, this week we're gonna be looking at coordinate planes. So send them a lecture or a short explanation or a cool activity to look at before class. As an extension, you could provide guiding questions and then you could also provide kind of like a pathway that helps guide them through the learning process. But this is the simplest, smallest way to start. Give them a video, give them a lecture to watch before class. So then they come to class prepared with questions, ready to apply it on practices problems, and you're there to then support them through that productive struggle. So in thinking about synchronous and asynchronous learning, um, especially since COVID, I've heard providers around the country saying, all right, we have to go online. Should we be doing this in real time or should it be anytime, anywhere? And I think it should be both. There is value in leveraging technology to support explanation outside of classes so that during class, we can use time to build relationships, work on projects and help our students with their unique learning needs. Those of you that may be excited and compelled by this idea, there's a further stretch that I wanna share here. So in the spirit of productive struggle, um, here are a few other ways to kind of think about how to continue evolving your instructional model. So first of all, we've already looked at blended instruction or flipped classrooms. Students should be able to access content before and after class. That is the single biggest move you can make today to free your time to do anything else. From there, consider flexible pacing. We can't, we can't force our students to move through content at the same time. They have unique needs, they have different life schedules, and so we need to create an environment where students learn at their own pace. And then lastly, we need to evolve towards mastery-based, where students progress when they demonstrate mastery. So to give you a quick example of what this can look like, develop a mastery tracker. So if you're working on Algebra 1, there are certain standards students need to master in Algebra 1. Create a visible tracker that's easy to see and easy to understand where students can learn how to track their own progress. 
this is not something that's punitive. And the more that you use it, it can be framed positively to say, hey, this is a tool to help you see where you're at and to see what kind of progress you need to make. I've seen examples of this in a public setting. So all students get to see everyone's progress and they start to serve as accountability partners for each other. Or if you have concerns about that and students struggle with confidence, just give each individual student their own tracker and it doesn't have to be public. I think the best benefit of this mastery tracker is that it combats the attitude that learning happens to students. Students stop showing up to class saying, hey, what are we working on today? Tell me what to do. They have this tracker, so they show up to class, they know what they need to work on and they get started and then you're there to support them. You can float around and reflect with them and check in on their progress and help them update their trackers, strategically pair students together for small group instruction or peer reviews. Um, and ultimately it frees up everyone's time to, to focus on more meaningful learning. So to take a slightly deeper dive into each of those elements, so let's talk about moving the lecture to before and after class. The impact on the teacher is probably clear at this point. You can now use your time to get to know your students. The student impact is they can use their time with peers and teacher on the most important part of the process, which is applying those principles in practice. Um, replace a one-size-fits-all pacing with flexible structures. The impact is that you now get to know the unique needs of your students and help support them through that differentiation. The student impact is it helps to build independent math learners because they are then in control of the pacing and it's on them to engage and use their time productively. Um, and then lastly, if we kind of evolve to that mastery based model, the benefit for you is that you will have formative data and the time to really help understand how to really support the unique needs of your students. And the student impact is that they will build confidence as they make progress and they see that progress in a meaningful way. So to pull out a quote, if we can shift towards this model, teachers can use the entirety of their class time to facilitate discussions, to work on reassessments and reflection. So then we can help students overcome those road bumps on their journey to authentic understanding. So those of you that are curious, check out the Modern Classroom Project. Um, and I'm going to share a link to that later on where you can take a deep dive into what these principles look like in practice. I should add a caveat that it is a K-12 focused project, but a lot of the principles could be transformative if we can figure out how to adapt them into the adult ed classroom. So to summarize, we can use our class time to collaborate. Asynchronous lectures mean we have more flexibility with our pacing and students are tracking their own mastery, which nurtures that metacognition and independent learning. So in practice, what this can look like, students complete a lesson and then they self-reflect about what went well in this lesson. Can I explain that I'm able to do these standards or not? It also supports that metacognition that's essential for 21st century success. So how did I use my time today? Why haven't I made the progress that I'm looking for? What additional support did I need? Where did I get stuck? And then you as a teacher are there to help nurture that independent learning process. So thinking about mastery based as the future, as a summation of that question, we want to get away from the clock time model. It's no longer about completion. And the example we see there is how many high school graduates have graduated but are not proficient in math. We want to nurture those metacognitive skills and help support independent math learners. So I want to summarize those in a way that I think is easy to frame in my mind. Just simply put, Blended in instruction refers to how content is delivered. We can deliver content before class, we can deliver content after class. The flexible pacing is how are we facilitating the room? Are we requiring every student to work on the same topic at the same time? Or are we allowing the classroom to adapt to the unique needs of each of our students? And then lastly, are we evaluating based on completing an assignment? Or if a student doesn't get it right, let's help them focus on revision and revise again so they learn through that, those mistakes and build new skills through that reflective experience. So as a quick start guide, if you're excited about any of these ideas, um, first of all, best thing you can do is remove the lecture. It doesn't mean lecturing is bad. It doesn't mean lecturing doesn't have a place in the learning process. It just means we have this extraordinary technology that can free our time. So send the lecture before class have it as a review activity after class, 
but use that sacred time with students on anything but the lecture because that's where rich conversations happen and that's where we build meaningful relationships with our students. Um, as the second stretch, consider developing a mastery tracker. This is not really doable though, unless you have meaningful assessments. And when I say assessments, I wanna clarify that it doesn't mean a standardized test. An assessment is just a way to review if a student has mastered a standard. This can be a problem set. It can be a video where students explain their thinking. It can be a peer review. There are so many creative ways to assess and we should push beyond the multiple choice test. And if we're wondering, hey, how am I gonna have time to grade all those assessments? Because we're not lecturing, assessment is a continuous process. You may have a student 20 minutes in the class that says, hey, I've mastered this, can you come over and check it out? And then you spend five minutes with that independent student because you're not spending time at the front of the room lecturing. And then lastly, I wanna say, remember our North Star is aspirational and I really appreciate the fact that using the term North Star is especially useful with a crowd from Minnesota. Um, I often find myself getting frustrated that I'm not where I wanna be as an educator. But remember, we set that North Star as a goal. Start as small as you want and then just be ready to make a lot of mistakes, share your experience with other educators and reflect and just keep growing from there. So if any part of today caught your attention, pursue that, go out and Google it, talk to other educators, let's talk after today and let's start small and remember that we're gonna grow over time because we are committed to this culture of continuous learning. So with that, I wanna wrap up with a few resources that hopefully can be useful for you as you kind of get started on this journey to explore what uh, 21st century teaching and learning can look like. So as a summation, um, we now know that digital literacy is, a ne is necessary. So blended learning brings technology into the classroom to address that issue. We know that the future of learning is, un is uncertain, plus students already struggle with transportation and family issues. So if we can move our instruction online, even when students come to campus, that makes the learning accessible anytime and anywhere. Um, we know that current programming only reaches about 10% of those in need, so technology can increase that access. Um, our, our classrooms are filled with mixed levels. The flexible pacing and the mastery base encourage us, encourages us to really get to know our students and enable students to become those independent math learners as they fight through their math anxiety and build confidence because they now control their learning arc. So my tagline that I go with is, we are all teachers, we are all students, and that is core in the 21st century. Let's restructure our classrooms so we're all learning from each other regularly. That is teacher to student, student to student, and student ideas to other interesting ideas. So you can definitely have access to the slide deck because there's a few resources I'll draw your attention to. The first is modernclassrooms.org. They have a free class with exemplar units, samples of mastery trackers, how to start developing your own instructional videos if you're interested in that. Um, you could easily complete that, that free online class this weekend. It's pretty short and again has sample units, sample mastery trackers. Check out modernclassrooms.org. Um, I once again want to emphasize this is a K-12 initiative. So my interest here today is trying to see how many of us are interested in this project. And then let's connect on Twitter, let's connect online so we can figure out how to apply this in an adult learning setting. Maybe not everything carries over, but I do think some of it will carry over. So let's figure that out together. And then as an extension, there are three short articles here that essentially talk about, hey, if you stop lecturing, what are the benefits? And then what can you now start spending your time on in the adult learning classroom? So with that, I wanna pause for a few questions, but before I do, a big, big, big thanks to the A team, to Atlas, to Astrid and Patsy and everyone that invited me here today. Also to my partner, Kristen Smith, who is maybe the best strategic thinker I've ever met when it comes to how to engage in a lesson and engage in a presentation. Um, it's been really fun developing this presentation. I wanna emphasize this is part one of part two. So we hope to see you after lunch because we're gonna look at all of these ideas in practice. What could it look like to flip one math lesson? What does that look like before class, during class? And then how can we get started planning our own flipped classrooms? So with that, I will open it up. I think we have a few, time, few minutes for um, 
questions, but Lindsay, please correct me if not. Um, so if anything came out in the chat, please highlight it for me. And if not, uh, I'll hope to see everybody this afternoon. Yeah, um, I will, if you have a question, we do have a few minutes, um, please throw it in the chat and maybe we will um, get to discuss it right now. But um, one thing that did come up earlier is just this, this problem or this issue of like, well, what if students aren't accessing that content before they get to class? Like, what do you do then um, if they're missing that lecture? Yeah, that's a great question. And so one thing that emphasizes is that shifting this model takes time and repetition. Our students have an ingrained idea about what education looks like. The teacher is the source of learning. I show up and learning happens to be in a passive way. And so shifting that mindset is going to take time and repetition. And so early on, you likely will have students that show up to class that have not done the pre-work. So you sit them off into a corner and they complete that pre-work. Over time, they're going to see that when they show up unprepared and everyone else is doing these fun projects and building relationships with each other and engaging with each other, it will encourage them to shift that mindset. Additionally, as they see that they are tracking their own progress, it's no longer learning happens to me. They will start to take ownership over that themselves because they can see what the results are through that kind of tracking. So I think the, the too long didn't read answer is if something doesn't work when you get started, don't abandon it right away. This takes time and we are combating decades long of how classrooms are structured. So it's gonna take patience, it's gonna take reflection and listen to your students, talk to them like, hey, what, what happened? Why didn't you watch the video? What can I do to better support you and help uh, nurture that kind of reflective process? Thank you very much. And I think too, um, even like with Zoom, that could be you know, utilizing volunteers and potentially putting them in their own breakout room. Like, hey, you can go here. There's a volunteer to work with you if they weren't able to, to complete it. Um, we have one more question um, that I want to get to. One is, so um, Sarah says, as a seasoned user of Google tools in the classroom, can you make some suggestions for how to get relatively low literacy students successfully on Google? Like the keeping track of accounts and passwords can be a big barrier. Yeah, absolutely. So maybe I'll actually just show a quick example of what that can look like on screen. And so for those students, that's a great comment, like the barriers with passwords accounts is even more troublesome. So I would start very small with those students. And what I would do is either one of two things. First of all, you could start a, a new Google Doc. Here's another digital literacy tip, docs.new, sheets.new, forms.new. It's a quick way to start a new Google Doc online. Um, you could create a very simple Google Doc that is Step one, watch this video. And let's just say it's a random YouTube video here. Um, you could create this and then bit.ly is a great extension for creating custom URLs. So I would create a bit.ly like this and then update the back half to bit.ly Joey's math class or whatever. That's a simple URL that they're gonna struggle with the first few times, but then you practice it. And over time, they'll get comfortable that every time you get lost, go to this URL. So as an extension of that, some of you might be familiar with HyperDocs. If you're not, Google it. You could create low tech or low fi access without accounts at all. Just create a HyperDoc, all of the content exists in it, and then give them that custom URL. So for the next two months, anytime you get lost, just come back to bit.ly, Joey's math class. You can text it to them so they have continuous access to it. So I would start with something where an account isn't required and just a simple landing page that they can get to and repeat that over time. Thank you so much. That is so helpful. Um, and with the, the chat, there's been so many things happening. So everybody, everybody <laughs> has been loving this. Um, I am going to um, share back so I just want to say again, thank you so much, Joey. That was, um, that was incredible. And I'm excited for part two at one o'clock this afternoon um, to kind of see this in action in a math classroom. So this is going to be awesome. Um, but next coming up, we have uh, the unconference session. So 
Uh, this is where you're going to need your flyer because you will have four options. There are four different topics to choose from. So join a conversation that you are interested in. Maybe you have ideas to share and successes to share, or maybe you are puzzling over things um, and over issues that have to do with that topic. So those came directly from the survey that we sent out um, pre-Math Institute. Um, so we'll close out this Zoom in just a moment, and then you will use the flyer to join a, another Zoom um, by clicking on the appropriate link. And then we are going to start promptly at 10.15 a.m. So um, yeah, thank you, and you are free to go. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank you.